Bonjour, Ani. Bonjour. Hello, everyone. My name is Celeste Pedri Spade, and I am the Associate Provost of Indigenous Initiatives at McGill University. And I'm so delighted to welcome everyone to this wonderful event. Thank you for joining us today. So this is the first event that I'm attending in my new role of Associate Provost Indigenous Initiatives here at McGill. And this role is also a first. Before I begin, uh, as an Anishinaabe Kwe from Mizadikang, Gaye Laktamalak, First Nation, uh, I'm mindful I'm coming here from my homelands, uh, which are more than a thousand kilometers away, you know, to this land here. And to come here in a respectful way for me as an Anishinaabe Kwe is to say thank you to the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe families, those with us today, and those who are now the people we honor as our ancestors. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the first edition of Ayu Winata at McGill. And again, speaking about firsts, uh, I was the first First Nations Anishinaabe person to receive a terminal degree in visual anthropology. And I did it in a way that honored my own cultural teachings as, as an artist. And so I'm extra excited about being welcomed into this space that celebrates the art, the creative genius, and ongoing presence of Inuit. So from September 8th to October 25th, um, McGill will host an event series that will showcase Inuit excellence, perseverance, and achievement in a variety of fields. Ayuanata means to never give up and to commit oneself to action, no matter how difficult the cause may be. And in choosing this name, we seek to recognize the Inuit learning, researching, teaching, and working in the McGill community, who champion Ayuanata to help move McGill forward. This will feature presentations by Inuit political leaders, health and wellness experts, climate change activists, artists, curators, and more. Its aim is to facilitate a range of opportunities for the McGill community and the Montreal community at large to learn from and engage with Inuit leaders, scholars, artists, and their work. Ayuinata at McGill has been made possible by the Office of the Provost and Vice Principal Academic and the Indigenous Studies and Community Engagement Initiative. McGill University is strongly committed to strengthening its relationship with Inuit communities, which it recognizes involves committing to opportunities that increase Inuit presence here, and doing this in a respectful and meaningful way. To this end, several important partnerships between the Office of First Nations and Inuit Education, the Indigenous Health Professions Program, and McGill's School of Continuing Studies and several Inuit communities have been established. McGill is also committed to making its campuses inclusive, welcoming, and successful places for scholars and students from First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities as specified in the final report of the Task Force on Indigenous Studies and Indigenous Education, convened in 2015 by interim principal Christopher Ment Freddy, with the goal of identifying steps McGill must take to further reconciliation and to prioritize Indigenous learning on campus. Physical representation and symbolic recognition are critically important. We see this through the exhibitions that are launched today, and we have also seen this on, on other areas of McGill's campus, campuses. It is imperative that we find ways to transform the places and spaces where we come together to learn in ways that First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people see themselves reflected within. That is a way to tell people, this is a place where you have a right to belong, and where you will be respected and valued. The IQ exhibition and TI art installation are helping achieve this goal, and they will allow our community to gain a deeper understanding of Inuit culture. These exhibits are a link between traditional knowledge and contemporary research. They are putting forward the significance, creativity, and the beauty of Indigenous art and they are helping to advance our objectives related to reconciliation, 
through critical education and understanding. I would now like to invite Inuk Elder Ripa Evik Carlton, who will proceed to the ceremonial lighting of the Kulik and share uh, her words of strength, resilience, and ingenuity. In my language, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm really honored um, to to be part of the opening of this of this important series that will be taking place. Um, I'm originally from a small community uh, on Baffin Island uh, called Pendleton. That's my home community. I was actually born on the land uh, way back. <laughs> it feels like I tell a story of, a, of another world when I talk about uh, where I was born and how I was raised using the very traditional child rearing that my people used. Uh, before we were ever really, before we were forcefully relocated because that's what happened to us. Um, so um, I'm um, I'm living in Ottawa. I've been in Ottawa for since 1991, and I've always worked in the helping field. Um, I've worked for the community, Tungas Inuit, Inuit, and then I started working for the Ottawa Inuit Children's Centre called back then, it's called Inuit now. So I've been away from the workforce for a little while, uh, taking care of a loved one. It's been over two years. Um, so I'm going to be going into lighting up the Kulik, which I'll uh, share as I'm lighting it because the Kulik was really a survival implement for my people um, because we lived in little dwelling units or hammak we call it, a sound house uh, in the winter months. That was our winter home um, and the winter months are cold up there and dark. So we really needed the light of the Kulit uh, during the dark season. Uh, and then we also used it for many other things, which I will explain one. Might take a little while, so bear with me. So the oil is rendered from any animal fat, like seal blubber, uh, whale blubber. Um, I've even heard of uh, oils that were rendered from fish oil, which would have been really, really hard really, really hard, and then caribou fat. But where I come from, because we were uh, right on the ocean, uh, we got the blubber from uh, like whale or seal. Um, so a lot of work went into uh, rendering the oil from the texture of, of the uh, animal. Hold on. Um, so, um, my mother would pound the blubber to get the oil out of the blubber or boil, boil it down, cutting it into small pieces, then boiling it until the oil starts to steep out of the oil. And then she would let it cool down and uh, squeeze more oil from, from the texture. 
So um, she would then give me that texture because it's crispy as a snack. Or she would give it out to people around her. And it almost hit, well, bacon, when I first had bacon for the first time, I thought of that treat that my mother would give us. <laughs> uh, so, and it, the plants are picked from the land when it's uh, like the season for collecting plants. That's what my people uh, did. Uh, it would be like maybe July or August that they would start to collect the plant a cotton and then another plant that they would get and they uh, hold on. It's very small, but the other uh, piece is very hard and it's also from the land and then the, the cotton. So you mix them together like how I did it and, and then that's the wick. So that pundit light can be on as long as the oil is in the center. This is just the miniature size. The real ones were really big and they would have more than one inside the hammock in the winter months. Uh, and uh, so we used it as light for warm, no electricity whatsoever at the time. <laughs> so this was the only light in, in the dark season and they cooked with it uh, in the winter months. So uh, made their bannock over it, uh, melted ice, because there's nothing from, uh, thawed in the winter months. Everything's frozen and lots of ice. So they would melt their water over, over the pudle and um, cook their meat, make tea. Um, or the other thing they used it for was to dry clothing over, over the, uh, the flame. So as a child, I was fascinated by the flames of the pudle like a lot of kids are with birthday candles or so I would try and play with it. And my mom had to discipline me at an early age that, you know, I could have burnt myself or burnt the up down, you know. <laughs> what a disaster that would have been. So uh, lots of wonderful memories. This really grounds me. It really helps me because uh, I'm very far removed from the home, from my homeland. So when I like the pudle, it's, it re, it's really soothing to me and it, it's grounding for me. Um, so, um, so I talked about having no electricity, no stores, no health centers or doctors or, you know, it was the people, the land and the animals, the ocean. That's the world I was born into. And, for quite a while, I thought we were the only people, you know, because <laughs> you've never seen other, other race, race of people. So uh, I thought we were the only people. I was very, very shy. Um, so um, the community, the settlement was being formed. Uh, so uh, when my mom and dad would go to the settlement to buy goods like tea or sugar or tobacco or whatever they needed. We would have to sometimes take a trip with, with, with the whole family and um, I was very shy. I had really curly hair back then so the people I wasn't used to would try and play with my hair and I would hide behind my mom's amounty the, the, the long piece where they uh, carry the babies in. So lots of wonderful memories. And um, so, um, like I was going to say, at night, uh, there was always a little light in the corner. 
they, she would put out all the other flames, but always left a little light in the corner. And uh, waking up from a bad dream or, or, you know, just waking up, the little light would really comfort me because there's no other light. So, and I sometimes imagine what it was for the men because the roles were very defined. Boys would be groomed to become providers and directors, <laughs> and us girls would be, you know, we would be taught to become mothers and wives and, you know, just caring for the family. So the roles were much more defined than they are today. So I did miss out a lot because I was six years old when we were forcefully moved. To the, to the community. And before, before the forced relocation, there was the um, uh, children were being picked up from these little camps. And I can't really comprehend what that would be for mom and dad and other parents in these little camps that had only like maybe the most 10 families, everybody knew everybody. And um, so it's very hard for me to understand what my parents went through. They never really talked about it. We're hearing more of these stories and it's wonderful because what that does to us is the pieces, like my puzzle pieces are put together more and more as I'm hearing stories. I'm sure Anika would agree too uh, when we hear elders talking about how it was and the teachings are wonderful. Um, so, very in tune with nature. I'm very comfortable with silence. I don't think I would do well in a big city like this. <laughs> I do better in Ottawa, I'm so used to it now, but uh, very comfortable with nature, harmony. You know, I felt loved by every adult in that camp. It was security, love, a harmony are my memories before everything changed for our people. Um, and there's wonderful teachings that were not written back then because we, we didn't go to school. My parents never went to school. My parents died not ever having a bank account because money wasn't, you know, important. Even when they were living in the community, money wasn't that important. And just for you to know, my people lived with very, very few items or material things. They had their pulle, they had their do dogs and sled and very, very small like material possessions. So that's where I come from. Um, and um, I just want to maybe share a little bit about the laws that I kind of mentioned, which were not written, but I'm grateful that they have written them um, now. Some of the things that elders have been working hard to put things down on paper. Um, these maligates, um, they were essential uh, beliefs that Inuit have held for generations. Elders describe Maligate as the fundamental laws. They defined how we should be with each other and how we can connect with our environment. They are the foundation of Inuit uh, which are how Inuit always have lived. They also provide a foundation for our spiritual development. And these are the four laws. Number one, working for the common good of each other. Inuit always shared. They cared a lot. 
um, there's ways about Inuit that I don't see with other uh, races of people in the world. Um, maintaining harmony and balance, those were very important because it's all, a lot of it was about survival in a harsh, harsh environment. So they had to have this money gate to live by. Uh, respecting all living things, including animals, each other, a lot of respect. Number four, continually planning and preparing for future. They had to, they had to. And they knew without maps where to go, we always travel. Uh, winter was where we were in this one camp, but springtime came, we were out camping, spring camps, collect, like uh, harvesting fish, seal, uh, whatever we needed. And then uh, all time, like this is when people would go for caribou, caribou hunting. There was also whale hunting that came uh, around June. So um, it, it, we always, we didn't have Hondas or cars or skidoos, so a lot of walking, you know, very healthy. The diet was right on the land. The diet came from our land, the ocean, um, birds, you know. I grew up with collecting seaweed, really, really good seaweed, really fresh. I grew up with clams and, you know, berries, blackberries and blueberries and little plants like leaves. Uh, and then a whole lot of meat because we needed the meat. Uh, we needed those um, nutrients that came from the animals up north, lots of fish, lots of birds. So that was the kind of world I live in. I long for that. I'm sure there's people here that would say the same thing where you're, there's no buildings, there's no stores, you are just one with nature. So when I go home to my community, it's very, um, it's surrounded by beautiful mountains. It feels like we land, I get out of the plane, and I'm like, the mountains are calling me. That's the feeling I get. It feels like those mountains call me. So that's the world. Uh, I'm not saying everything about Inuit, but that was my early, uh, my early beginnings. And I'm so happy that I can share it with you and maybe you can learn a few things here and there. And I'm very happy that this university is taking on this series to learn more about not just Inuit, but also other indigenous people. So I'm grateful because really, Anik is my future leader. Our young people are our future leader. The more we can invest and support them, uh, the, the better it is going to be for us old, because we're getting older, you know. Um, so I like to um, I like to say uh, thank you for having me, and uh, the food will be delicious because I I taste it. <laughs> I cheat it today, so thank you. Merci. Thank you so much for sharing these powerful teachings about your way of life and for sharing these beautiful stories about the way that you lived in that home that you long for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's now my pleasure to invite interim Principal Manfredi up to say a few words. It's been a while since I was in a classroom. I was going to try to use my professor voice, but I think I'll use the microphone. 
Well, thank you very much, uh, Professor Pedri Spade, and let me say how pleased we are to welcome you as a colleague at McGill. A special thank you to Elder Ripa Evick Carlton for her beautiful ceremony and testimony of her life in the North. And a big thank you to the Honorable Mark Miller, Minister of Crown Indigenous Relations, for providing a video greeting to be played a little bit later. Esteemed guests from the extended McGill and Indigenous communities, c'est un grand honneur pour moi que mon premier événement public en tant que principal par intérim soit ce vernissage de l'exposition IQ uh, pour inaugurer Awinata at McGill. En tant que vice principal exécutif et vice principal aux études, j'ai eu le privilège d'accompagner l'exposition IQ à l'extérieur du Canada, plus récemment à Dubaï pendant les célébrations du début du troisième siècle de McGill. La pandémie a malheureusement euh, rendu nécessaire le report de sa présentation à McGill jusqu'à maintenant, mais nous sommes très heureux de pouvoir enfin la présenter à la communauté mcgilloise. Je suis également ravi que nous nous associons à l'évoque architecture et plus particulièrement à la commissaire de l'exposition Isabelle Laurier. Je voudrais remercier Isabelle et son équipe pour tout leur travail pour monter l'exposition. I'd also like to thank the McGill team, and especially Annika Anderson, or Annika Ghosh, she's right in front of me, uh, for their work in organizing the exhibition and other events, including the complimentary installation of works from McGill's visual arts collection, the TI exhibit. Inuit Aoyimei Tukanit, the Art, Architecture, and Traditional Knowledge, is an exhibition of work by seven Inuit artists chosen by competition to create works of art for the integration, for integration into the Canadian High Arctic Research Station, or CHARS, in Cambridge Bay or Iqaluktuk. The IQ exhibition actually tells three distinct stories. It tells the story of the design and construction of a world-class scientific research facility. It tells the story of the use of art to recognize the enduring importance of traditional knowledge and to promote reconciliation by grounding the CHARS facility in the reality of its local indigenous community. And of course, it tells the story of selecting the artists. The exhibition brings international exposure to the extraordinary skills and creative vision of Canadian indigenous artists. It also highlights the way in which artistic installations, which are a core humanities practice, can coexist with and indeed augment scientific research facilities. Moreover, the exhibition demonstrates the importance of recognizing and making space for Indigenous knowledge within the research paradigm underlying facilities like CHARS. In September 2019, McGill University became partners with AVOC and others to support the international dissemination of the exhibition. The dissemination of the exhibition is consistent with McGill's mission of inclusiveness, and most importantly, with key, key calls to action of the Task Force on Indigenous Studies and Indigenous Education. It's also part of McGill's commitment to the North, both as a site of research and as the location for a critical part of our responsibility for delivering health and social services. The exhibition provides a compelling example of how Indigenous representation can be embedded in the very fabric of a building, something that is very important to McGill as we seek to expand the physical representation of Indigenous reality on our campuses, especially in grand projects such as the New Vic and Fiat Lux developments. I'm so delighted that the IQ exhibition is a central pillar of Ayuinata at McGill in which we honor Inuit excellence an achievement in many fields. So I'm going to now invite Celeste back to introduce uh, the curator of the exhibition. I'd like to, um, um, to interrupt Principal McVeigh for your words. It's now my pleasure to invite the curator of the IQ exhibition, Ms. Isabel Laurier, to say a few words. Thank you, Christopher, for your kind and wise words, and thank you all. 
Thank you for being there. Tung Gasuyit, bienvenue, welcome. Art is a powerful empowerment and reconciliation tool. Integrating Inuit artworks into architecture reinforces the expression of Inuit culture. Therefore, self-esteem, sense of wellness, sense of well-being, and sense of pride become the output of the work. It's all about sustainable development as a values-driven approach. We truly believe that Together, art and architecture form a powerful tool of cultural identity. Ensemble, l'art et l'architecture constituent un puissant vecteur identitaire. Ici, art et architecture travaillent main dans la main pour exprimer le narratif culturel inuit. L'exposition Inuit How Yimayit to Come Hit Art, architecture et savoir traditionnel vise à donner aux artistes inuit la visibilité qu'ils méritent et qui s'est trop fait attendre. Cette exposition montre comment une communauté inuit et des artistes inuit se sont réunis pour raconter leur histoire à travers l'art et l'architecture. L'exposition est également l'occasion de souligner la présence durable du Canada dans l'Arctique. This exhibition called Inuit How Yimeyitu Can Hit Art, Architecture and Traditional Knowledge aims to give Inuit artists the visibility they deserve, which has been long in coming. What you will see in the exhibition room next door, or with what you already saw, is the result of the winners of a pan Canadian Inuit art competition for integrating art into the architecture of the Canadian High Arctic Research Station, better known as the CHARS. This was the first in the history of the Canadian Inuit art world. Seven artists, Ningyo Kuluktili, Sami Kudluk, Victoria Gray, Tim Pitsulak, Ulayu Pilurtut, Bobby Anadilak and Cousin Curly. As curator of this prestigious Inuit art exhibition, it is my privilege to introduce this traveling expo to the rest of the world. This exciting expo of Canadian Inuit artworks has already been presented in seven different venues. After successful showings around the world, the Inuit How Yimeni Kukan Hit exhibition is back in Montreal. Evoke Architecture is thrilled to present the IQ Expo to help celebrate McGill's third century anniversary. The artworks presented illustrate the artist's acute sense of observation. They reflect the close ties with all forms of life in the Arctic, with, which inspires them with the greatest respect. The works speak about the knowledge of the environment and the traditions that enable the Inuit to survive for millennia in the rich but often unforgiving climate of the Arctic. It's all about Canadian Inuit artists. It also tells the story of an Inuit community and architects putting their hearts and heads together, their knowledge and their skills to design a research facility that the Inuit are proud of and can call their own. The genius of the Renaissance will have been to combine the arts in one place, architecture, drawing, paintings, culture, etc. With the chars, the Inuit's cultural resurgence follows this holistic path. We truly believe that 
protection and promotion of cultural diversity through art and architecture is a responsible and powerful approach. Mon équipe technique évoque architecture. Madina, Anya, Sébastien, Vincent et Joyce. Merci pour votre dévouement. Finalement, je m'en voudrais de passer sous silence, comme c'est trop souvent le cas, le nom de celui qui, convaincu que l'architecture constitue un important véhicule identitaire, a contribué pendant plus de 45 ans à soutenir les communautés autochtones dans leur volonté de devenir maître de leur environnement bâti, celui dont l'immense dévouement et engagement de longue date lui ont permis de devenir un interlocuteur respecté des Autochtones et un artisan du dialogue entre les nations, j'ai nommé l'architecte Alain Fournier. Voilà, c'est tout ce que j'avais à dire. Je serai dans la pièce avec vous pour la suite, pour prendre des bouchées et boire du vin et répondre à toutes vos questions. Pour ceux qui sont intéressés à vraiment faire une... Une visite officielle, il y a un sens à l'expo, donc en entrant dans la pièce, vous tournez à gauche et vous faites le tour jusqu'à la toute fin, c'est le sens officiel, c'est le narratif officiel. Merci à toutes et à tous, très bonne soirée à vous, merci pour votre présence. Merci. So this concludes our opening ceremony. And it is my pleasure to invite all of you to enjoy the beautiful exhibitions, to gather with friends and colleagues and enjoy the delicious hors d'oeuvres prepared by award-winning Anouk Chef, Trudy Metcalf Co, and Chima Gwetch Trudy for preparing the delicious food back home. We say that is the most important, most honorable work is preparing the food for the people. So, Miigwech. Mm -hmm.